Well, I want to thank everyone for coming today. Um, I'm, my name is Mark Ross. I'm, uh, I'm very excited that my good friend and business partner, Jeremy Haft, uh, he's launching his second book, Made in China. Uh, many of you know Jeremy, his bio is on the chair, but I just want to share a little bit about him. Um, he graduated from Columbia University. He actually started, he was one of the first successful internet pioneers in the late 90s, in the early aughts. He uh, actually uh, was a successful internet entrepreneur and uh, part of Web 1.0, and which you don't hear too much about. He actually got out before uh, all the silliness and pets.com <laughs> craziness. But what's interesting about Jeremy, after he successfully worked in that space, uh, he decided to take on another interesting challenge and work in China, which is really early days. And last nearly two decades, he's been doing business in and out of China, exporting products, sourcing products. He's currently uh, working with the New York State to deliver high-end agricultural products to the uh, citizens of China. So the cool thing I think about Jeremy is actually he understands the policy. He's actually been on the front lines of actually doing business, which I think in this town is very unique. There aren't, I mean, obviously there's a lot of smart, talented people in this town, but there aren't a lot of people that have actually uh, met a payroll and created a business, and Jeremy's done it in two unique spaces. So uh, this book is a really interesting uh, collection of his experiences over the last two decades. And moderating the event tonight is our good friend Steve Clemens with the Atlantic and MSNBC. So the format, we're going to have a little discussion, and then we're going to open up to Q&A. Hopefully we'll have a fun, lively discussion. Thank you so much, Mark. Really appreciate everybody being here. Uh, yes, give, give Mark a round of applause. It's highly irritating that he's wearing a cooler jacket than I am. Um, but you have a better I, I shirt. I also think that you know we should pay homage to this great venue, 1776, which you know has come into probably one of the least innovative and creative cities in the world, and and created some hope uh, here in this spot. And it's why I won't wear a tie here. I, I did wear a tie here once. I made a mistake, and I won't do it anymore. And I was at a startup city Miami event that the Atlantic hosted, and someone was wearing this T-shirt. That, that Humans are better than robots. And I was down with Richard Florida or something on the stage, and I said, are they really? I really trust robots more. And 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 humans are just, you know, complete question marks. And uh, uh, and it, I decided to wear this tonight because after taking a look at Jeremy's incredibly provocative, it's a highly provocative book. How prov I mean, it's so provocative that you bought four of them. Show, hold them up. Just show what you're doing. Quadruple sales and one purchase. Yeah, this purchase. is this yeah. is uh, obsessive. It's gonna, you know, but but uh, because you would think that robots are better than humans, unless they're made in China. After reading your book, right? So so unmade in China, the hidden truth about China's ec economic miracle is what we're here talking about. Uh, and Jeremy, you've done this, which is you you really turned things on your head because as we sort of listen, I mean, this reminds me of the 80s and 90s where our uh, juggernaut concern was Japan at that time. You had people like Akio Morita out saying, we're going to eat your lunch and there's nothing you can do about it. You had Shintaro Ishihara and others that were uh, incredibly arrogant about Japan's place in that world. That that fell away, but you, you've had a kind of swagger uh, both from China and then also a kind of grudging acknowledgement in the U.S. that job flow, you hear Donald Trump out there lambasting China. In the last election four years ago, I remember, you know, neither one did it uh, necessarily, well, only, only one winner, but both Barack Obama uh, and Mitt Romney were hammering on China through that election. People don't remember it, but that, you know, it was about, uh, of all things, currency manipulation. Said on day one, now we're talking about day one on Iran deals, but day one, we're going to announce that China is a currency manipulator. Um, and, and, and so China is part of our consciousness, and you're saying that's all silly. And so tell us what took you down this path. T tell us the quick outline of the book. Thank you, and thanks for being here. Um, and thank you all for coming and being here tonight. Uh, it's great to see after two years in the attic, I'm out of pajamas. Uh, the jacket still fits, and uh, it's wonderful to see you all. So thank you. Um, how I got here is a long, circuitous journey uh, that began in 1997, 1998. Uh, as Mark said, I was coming off of a tech startup and was looking for the next China play. I, I thought that internet might be the next big thing um, in China, uh, but I wasn't sure. So I, I raised a little bit of capital and hired a team of engineers, and we started way up at Raw Materials and walked the supply chain all the way down 
just to sort of see, you know, how are things made in China? So, you know, you're making a, a bottle or a, or a cup or a microphone. What are the differences? Um, and after 18 months and visiting over 800 suppliers, uh, interviewing management, looking at plant and equipment, um, we started to realize, gee, you know, there are some startling and structural differences between the way that we make things in China versus the way that we make things here. And, you know, I, I didn't come from a manufacturing background, right? So, I mean, I tended to think, uh, you look at an ad for Dell computer, and, um, you know, at the click of a mouse, you're gonna order a computer, and then a whole bunch of little elves go scurrying and making your computer for you, and, and out it arrives. Um, well, you know, in the United States, things kind of work that way. I mean, we're the beneficiaries of almost 400 years of evolving corporation law and evolving industries so that, you know, to make something like a bottle, you know, might take maybe three or four players from beginning to end. Um, you know, whereas in China, we realize that wending a product through a supply chain in China might take 15 or 17 or 20 players. And suddenly we realize, my goodness, things are starkly different. So over the years, we went on to uh, source and import from China, you know, dozens of different products um, across many different product categories. So everything from, you know, dental bite blocks to digital music players to, you know, chum buckets and air conditioner louvers and, and air conditioner vents and uh, all the way up to oil rigs um, and refineries. And, and these days we're flowing the other way. So we're selling American agricultural products to China um, high-end products from New York State, maple and honey, um, as well as cattle hides. So I've gotten a chance to see the breadth of the Chinese supply chain from lots of different angles. Um, and the takeaway for me was, and it was in the middle of that Obama-Romney election, where, by the way, they ran 4,000 anti-China ads in Cleveland alone. Um, you know, so, and, and both campaigns were, were hit in China. We're starting to hear it again in these campaigns. And I was thinking, well, you know, the perception that we have in America is not squaring with the reality on the ground. So there was this famous Pew study that came out in 2012 um, where a majority of Americans responded that they believe that China is the number one economic superpower in the world. And across the world, a majority of countries that answered this question said China. So guess what country said that China wasn't the number one superpower in the world. It was China. So talking about kind of the swagger, I think part of this J is that... Japan used to pull that trick, too. Right, well, that's true. That's true. Um, but I think some of it is that China has insight into how things really work on the ground there. Um, and that same disconnect is being played out in, in these elections um, today. So... As I understand it, you know, you, you have a sense and you've looked through the supply chain. One of the things that I had, I'd taken a quick look at in your book is that you said one, China is organized not around large corporations, but, but many, many small ones in contrast to Japan that has these large firms. Cool. And, and, and in my mind, that, that misreads Japan, that Japan may have networks of companies that are organized in Zaibatsu or Keidatsu or whatever you want to, uh, designate them. Um, and and that they may be controlled in terms of you know what their profit margins are, and they they you know may, may get more under demand. But but Japan's innovative base or the base that was out there was actually a lot of small firms organized by conglomerates. Mm. And I'm wondering is there is there a difference that you saw between you know hardcore Japanese and Chinese industrial organization that yielded these different outcomes? Uh, yes, uh, I I would say so, and some of that is idiosyncratic too. Um, the era of Mao, and, and when Mao set up uh, the industrial base from province to province, he wanted every province to be self-sufficient. So each province would have its own mill and its own brewery and its own auto, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so we, we still today have remnants of that sort of redundant system, um, as well as this wellspring of new entrants that are rising up from the bottom, lots of small firms. So um, what we have is essentially a supply chain that's like an ant pile that's been kicked, basically. Um, total disorder. And what I've noticed is that um, if you step back and you look at the daily safety issues, and literally they are, they are daily safety issues in every corner of China's economy. So spanning 
you know, glow in the dark pork and exploding cantaloupe and shirts that unravel and bridges that collapse and buildings that fall over and glass that tumbles out of buildings. Um, you know, to the extent where people are going on television saying, can we drink a glass of milk that's safe anymore? Um, you take a step back and say, hmm, there have been thousands of these just in the past few years, you know, tens of thousands over the past decade. Um, the authorities would have us believe something close to, this is a few bad apples in the bunch, but in fact, my big takeaway and what the central thesis of the book is that um, the whole system is to blame. You know, so we've seen some some Chinese scholars coming out and saying that, well, it's a collapse of Confucian morals, for example. And I I actually feel that it, it's more of a structural issue. That I mean, how, yeah. How do you how do you weight this? Because w I I agree with everything you said, except right. what I don't know is is how how large a footprint are these things you know i've seen the buildings that have fallen fallen over right. you know we've seen the the blast in tianjin we saw the cctv uh, cctv tower burn and no news about it in china um we, we've seen a lot of these problems but you know at the same time when you look at what china's done in the last 30 years they've lifted the equivalent of the entire population of the united states out of poverty so when you look back to the late uh 1800s, early 1900s, and you had many of the things that you're talking about today um, in China happened then, and you had an incredible, that's where the worker and labor movement came out of, was the abuses and the, uh, uh, you know, the snake oil, you know, the, the snake oil salesman, all of that stuff that you're seeing in fast for forward movement in China, it happened here in the United States. So is, is it not just part of the game of lifting that many people out of poverty. So how do you weight it when you've lifted 300 million out of poverty? There's now economic weight there. This isn't happening throughout the system, or are you arguing it, it is? I'm arguing it is, and I'm saying that the main difference between China and us is that, and the West, is that we had a system that supported the free flow of people and ideas and capital um, that, that supported this innovation, whereas China does not have the free flow of goods and people and capital and ideas. Um, and so uh, there, there's a system, I mean, we're seeing it play out now in the allocation inefficient of capital, um, forming bubbles in different parts of the economy. But um, in terms of how widespread the footprint is, I would say, um, from my vantage point, it's, it's, it stretches across every industry. Mm. And, and every node of production so that as raw materials pass and are transformed into finished goods, every stage of production adds risk that the products will be unsafe. So they're moving from um, often inferior raw materials to weakly governed firms right. to long, long opaque supply chains to inefficient regulators. So e every link of the chain adds risk that the outputs will be unsafe, um, which is one of the reasons why we keep seeing these safety scandals. Now, to the United States, this is danger uh, because we regulate very little of what we import from China, and we've seen a glimpse of these made-in-China risks over and over again. So with Heparin and Mattel and, you know, the bridge spans on the San Francisco Bay Bridge, et cetera. But it's also opportunity. And this is where the book, I feel, um, diverges from what we hear from the, the candidates. As China struggles to make safe goods reliably, its consumers and its firms overwhelmingly choose American-made products. Are you worried about this blowing up? <laughs> I know. I have it in my Mine's pocket. Made in actually. China, probably by Foxconn. Yeah. You know, and and so when you do see amazing success stories, and and my colleague at the Atlantic, Jim Fallow, said it's mm -hmm. not such an amazing success story that Foxconn has so so many different problems. But right. when it comes down to the kind of product that Steve Jobs was able to draw out of that environment, when you look at this, this came out of China. It was made by Chinese, designed here. It's part of the Chinese economic miracle that we fear. Um, your argument is that this really didn't steal many American jobs. Right. You have one also. So, so tell us the <laughs> Apple story. I, th I feel like this yeah. is very much a mirage. Okay. So walk us through the, the mirage. Okay. So the mirage begins with the made in China label. And if we take a stroll down any big box store aisle, we see made in China, made in China. And this is part of the illusion that China is killing us in the world economy. Um, part of the problem is that the way that we measure the value of trade and our trade balance is 
100% of the value was assigned to the last country that shipped it to us. So if it costs $180 to make one of these things, China adds maybe $6 worth of value through assembly. The components are sourced uh, South Korea, Germany, Japan, and the United States. And the IP came from the United States, and the software came from the United States. And yet 100% of the value of this phone is assigned to China, therefore distorting the trade imbalance and making China loom much larger um, in, in our rearview mirror as if China's about to run over us in the economy. Um, frankly, many of the products we import from China contain goods that are made in the United States. So, you know, the cotton in your shirt, mm -hmm. uh, the steel in um, an air conditioner vent, the components in this, the capital equipment that solar panels are built on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And those inputs support jobs across this country um, and are not counted in the trade numbers with China. So to, in my mind, this is very much an example of how we need to be altering our trade calculations. Japan is doing it. They're actually starting to measure value, the value add in products. We need to be doing the same. So I'm trying to fight, figure out if Jeremy Haft and Donald Trump agree, <laughs> uh, and you come at it from different, what's that? Yeah, for just from different directions where Trump is saying, you know, China's doing bad things, China's stealing our jobs, we need to invest more here, we need to make America great. You're saying China makes shitty pro pro products, we don't have to worry about them, we're seeing investment and higher rates of return and better quality here in the United States. Are you really just two sides of the same coin? We're two sides of the same hair, actually. Um, <laughs> I, I think um, we do have to worry about Chinese danger in terms of products. And I think we need to be doing a lot more to protect ourselves. The FDA only has 27 people on the mainland. Um, it would take the FDA 10 years to inspect the 4,000 exporters that are sending food and drugs over to our country, um, at least 4,000. Um, people don't, I mean, you should emphasize, people don't realize that the US made products are subjected to a much higher regime of inspection than are their competing same category imports. Correct. Um, and in why, fact, why do we stand for that? Uh, why do we stand for that? Um, part of this is a bilateral negotiation. I mean, it was a big deal just to get 27 inspectors into the country. Vice President Biden had, had to go over and make a special deal. So there's a lot of resistance. I think part of it is um, Chinese authorities wanting to protect local companies and help them grow. Um, so they resist the kind of inspection. But, you know, that really comes back to bite us with cases like Baxter and Heparin, right, where you have tainted blood thinner that wends its way through an unsafe supply chain. Um, and, you know, I think it's incumbent on American firms to lean forward more and do more inspection. I mean, Baxter didn't even inspect their API factory, frankly. So back to the Trump thing, I think we, there's danger. But I also feel like where, where I diverge with Trump um, is the whole China's killing us point of view. Um, I actually feel You're that... You're saying China's killing themselves. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I feel that because, in a way, yeah. And to the extent that China... Um, creates risky products is the extent that they buy our products. So if you're a mom in Shanghai and you have a choice between an American-made baby formula, for example, versus Chinese-made baby formula, and you remember the melamine and the milk that poisoned 300,000 babies, you're going to pay 30% more for American-made. Uh, my export firm today is exporting honey and maple out of New York State at a very high premium to the local products. And we're selling because of the American brand. Um, same with cattle hides, for example. You know, we're getting a premium on American cattle hides. How do you go about finding a cattle hide to export? Uh, like, you're Jeremy Haft. You live in D.C. Yeah. Like, how do I do just, that? How do you do that? I mean, just... <laughs> <laughs> this is so I'm, interested, I'm, I'm actually interested in a little bit of the nuts and bolts. You're talking about things that, you know, we gloss over... Uh, in a way, many of us who don't have the experience you do in sort of the the tactile nature of actually shipping honey somewhere. That's kind of interesting. Uh, cattle hides more so. Um, but then how did you get into China? How did, how did this turn you on to the degree to go sit in pajamas for two years and write a book in the attic? 
Um, the politics and the rhetoric, actually, and seeing the disconnect between what was going on on the ground and what I was hearing in D.C. Um, I kept hearing reflected back through us this image of China about to take over the world, and yet what I was seeing on the ground was something totally different. Um, I actually believe that America has an abiding competitive advantage, frankly. We still can manufacture goods that sell and that are competitive and that China needs and that China is willing to buy. Um, it's just that those are not reflected in our discourse. So getting to something like a cattle hide, I mean, this is, you would think, a pretty straight up commodity, um, and yet there are degrees of quality with cattle hides. And in fact, um, cattle hides that come from Costa Rica, for example, might have holes in them, you know, from bug bites, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the, the cattle hides from America are considered to be premium quality and and we're selling them by the full sea container now that's a product that gets processed into you know a belt or a wallet or shoes and then gets re-exported back to the united states and so again the hides are an input into an import and yet that american made input would never get reflected in the trade balance numbers of what's coming from china which is one of the problems why China looms so large um, in our view. Did you ever read the book Beijing Jeep? No. By Jim Mann. So in Beijing Jeep, this must have been written 20, 25 years ago, uh, James Mann, who's here, was in the Los Angeles Times, wrote the story of how Jeep had gone over, set up a manufacturing facility, and essentially, to make a long story short, many of the employees there essentially stole the designs, the intellectual property, the processes, copied, reverse engineered the machinery, went down the road, uh, and replicated and made their own version of the Jeep. Uh, and it was one of the most egregious cases of sort of property theft at, at, at some level. And you saw this across lots of categories. Today, Qualcomm uh, is struggling. It, it, you know, they make the the little gadget that kind of connects all of our cell phones over, and they've been competing by uh, trying to stay ahead technologically. Well, China has begun to shut them down in lots of different ways, and has uh, seemingly given instructions. I say seemingly because I don't have the such, but but to to stop having companies that were paying licensing fees to paying licensing. So it seems like an orchestrated, strategic, predatory thing going on. So do you worry about that? Because lots of U.S. companies do. I mean, you mentioned GE and others there, and almost every major company that I know of, big companies, that were part of the effort to achieve permanent normal trading relations with China. I worked in the Senate then. Almost every single one of those companies regrets it today mm. uh, because they feel that the predatory targeting and the uh, what they see as the sort of unfair environment in China that they're dealing with. So I, I just want to bring that reality and see how you how it squares with with your concern that China's not getting it together. A huge problem. Um, some companies have figured out workarounds for the IPR issues. You know, so there's a great uh, medical dental wholesaler, the largest in the world, called Henry Schein. $2.1 billion company, um, New York Stock Exchange traded. And they source their catalog of products from hundreds of Chinese factories. Um, and they found that, yeah, their book was being copied. I mean, that, that the dental bite blocks and all these things were, were being copied and sold out the back. So they went to their suppliers and said, hey, okay, we, you know, we know that you have an incentive to copy us. We're going to turn you guys into our sales force. So they, they essentially said, you sell, all you need to do is sort of keep our brand together um, and abide by these requirements and we'll cut you in on a nice profit. Now, has it eliminated all of the infringement? No, it has a lot of it. Um, of course, this is a huge problem, but I feel that especially on the higher end manufacturing that, I mean, I, you know, I had a student who was a, a, an Air Force major who said that, you know, China's tried to copy, for example, stealth fighters. And the problem is that, you know, you can steal terabytes of data, but that doesn't mean that by pushing it through that structurally risky supply chain where node by node adds risk and risk and risk, that at the other end, they can make something as complex as a stealth fighter. I, just very, very quickly, I mean, we tend to take for granted what, companies do 
So when we go to a company, we look around and we expect to see certain things, like a clear line of reporting from the CEO on down, like clearly defined roles and responsibilities. Um, if you don't have accountability in a company, you can't make safe products reliably. So Chinese companies, very typically, from the largest companies on down, lack this very basic DNA. So should, should, should we short Alibaba? I would be. <laughs> okay, you heard it here. You heard it here. I, I would be, yeah. but 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 they're also, I mean, close with the state, and uh, but but in any event, well, that's for another conversation. So, very 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 quick anecdote about Shell Oil trying to source an offshore drilling rig from China's best and brightest shipyard. Recently, um, they were going to buy a billion dollar offshore rig to go into the Gulf of Mexico. They went and inspected the shipyard, and the shipyard flunked on every single measure um, because they lacked very basic lines of reporting, very basic roles and responsibilities. They lacked the procedures to handle hazardous materials. They lacked the ability to check quality in their suppliers. So here we have a company that is buying stuff from suppliers and putting it together. They weren't even able to check the quality of that. And this is a multi-billion dollar state-owned corporation. And so we see this is a matter of kind of the weak corporate governance I was talking about. Um, and you know, these are the companies that's actually going to be replicating stealth fighters. Um, I don't think so, frankly. So yes, IPR is a big problem, but let's put it in perspective. I mean, China's one diesel-powered aircraft carrier. I don't see them leapfrogging all the way into 21st, 22nd. Well, well, the Tian, so Tianjin disaster definitely supports your 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 view. Yeah. Are, when you did your survey of companies and and in all of the look of supply chains, one are there are are there any anomalous examples to you that you f find impressive in China? Any companies or fields that you think are you know head and shoulders above others in China that you're dismissing right now? No. Interesting. <laughs> no, no, none, no, not an entire industry. So there are individual companies that one sees, but each industry has structural problems. And you mentioned Tianjin. I mean, one of the issues with Tianjin is at the regulatory level. So you've got industrial safety. That, that accident was one of 300 accidents just in the past seven months major accidents. And part of the problem is that, you know, as unsafe raw materials move through to weak corporate governance to long supply chains, by the time they get to the regulatory level, there's more risk. So with Tianjin, there were five different regulators that were supposed to be overseeing that um, industrial safety. Well, well, the logistics fixture on the Tianjin, on, on the company involved there, actually prided itself on evading all of those. Correct. Yeah, and, that, I mean, that, right. that, that was the... You know, part of the story there that we're learning now is that you, you actually have firms that were growing very rapidly with people connected to the state council and others that were essentially evading the governance and the reporting requirements and the inspectors and others uh, and were growing rapidly and building assets and then, you know, creating bombs, essentially. Right. Oh, and that's, that's part of the problem is that when you have five different regulators with the same portfolio, it creates bureaucratic blind spots and conflicts um, where, you know, those are places where these companies can kind of move through and, and find their opportunities for um, making maximum profit with low safety. So we're going to go to the audience here in a moment. Xi Jinping is coming to town. What do you think the president Xi Jinping ought to? What do you think the president ought to get from Xi Jinping or talk about with regard to some of the issues that are related to your book? I feel that uh, food and drug safety tend to be at the bottom of the list. Um, we we tend to hear a lot about other national security concerns that I would argue are not national security concerns. So I don't believe the currency, believe it or not, is a national security concern. Frankly, um, if you look. From 1991 to now, um, over the last 25 years, when the yuan is cheapest, you know, we would expect to be shedding jobs, but we're actually adding jobs in our economy. There's no correlation between the value of China's currency and, and our job numbers. Um, I would argue the national security issue is the clear and present danger presented by food and drug safety and, and, and what we're importing. And that is always relegated to the bottom of the list. I, I would hope that that would be talked about, but it probably won't be. Have we had be. any case? I mean, I, I just don't know the stories. Do we, have we had cases in the U.S. of imports here of disasters that have happened? What would, what would be a few of those? So uh, for drugs, I mean, the worst has been heparin. Okay. 
um, which uh, is a blood thinner um, that uh, is actually way upstream, is made from the mucous membrane of pig intestines. So if you've already hit the food bar, you probably want to stay away that's, from that's it now. The barn down yeah. from the cattle house. That's exactly right. right. I've I've been to that barn. Um, so uh, and that wends its way down through the supply chain. Um, that that actually was uh, tainted and counterfeited with sort of a cheaper version of it. Um, and well, right. Oh, I know. I know. Well, the so after swine flu. The price of pork went through the roof because of scarcity. So th there was a counterfeit version of well, there the was fox stuff. meat, rat meat. We were reading all about exactly. it. I mean, there was all yeah. sorts of other meats that began to. So enter maybe that was the heparin the that food chain. Yeah, lovely. I'm just saying. Um, just, right. Yeah, right. Uh, moving on. Uh, yeah. So heparin, heparin was was a big one. Um, we, you know, over 100 Americans died in American hospitals here. Um, we've had a number of food food safety as well. So um, f from Whole Foods, you know, we've seen the um, th those uh, veggie crisps, you know, that kids like to eat. And one of them was sprayed with this preservative spray from China that made made a whole bunch of kids sick. Um, you know, it's been found that a lot of the apples coming out of China are coated in arsenic, while two thirds of the apple juice concentrate that goes into our kids' drinks. Were they watching like Snow White or something? <laughs> I know exactly. Yeah. They are now. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, we're. I mean, we've we've seen um, pretty major scandals in each one of those categories, and um, and I feel like those problems are are not going away. I mean, we imported 4 billion pounds of food from China just a couple years ago, and that number is going up. 80% um, of the active pharmaceutical ingredients in drugs that we ingest are coming from foreign sources. Half of that is coming from China. So you can say roughly 40 to 50% of, 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 of what we're ingesting is coming from these sources that are not um, regulated in any way over there, and we're not regulating them either. I promise to go to you guys next, but this is in interesting to me. The, um, uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote a piece about a woman named Heather Bresch, happened to be the daughter of Senator Joe Manchin, mm -hmm. and she was she is the CEO of Mylan Pharmaceuticals and was leading a charge at that time, which both the industry and the FDA didn't like very much, which was surprising, was saying that in the generics uh, pharmaceuticals industry, they, India, the Philippines, China, and others had, didn't have the same inspection regime as companies that were manufacturing in the U.S. And so they were under increasing pressure. It was an unfair playing field. And she advocated and went back and tried to work revising 1930s era laws, uh, to get fees to pay for more inspectors for the foreign plants. And it was a fight, but she finally succeeded in bringing both industry and that. Are, are you aware, aware of what she did, and has that, has that made any difference? So um, I am aware of what she did, and that has not made any difference in China. It's a big diplomatic and bureaucratic turf war. I mean, just we, the FDA had two people in China when the heparin scandal hit hmm. in 2008. And then they had to fight like the Dickens to get it up to 17, and they released this press release, woo, we got 17 people in China. Really? Oh, okay. Well, that, that makes me feel better. You know, now they have 27, but again, I mean, that's nowhere close. And China actively denies visas for American inspectors trying to fly in and inspect. And of course, Baxter and other companies that want to forward deploy up the chain and, and look at their suppliers, I mean, the doors are closed. So, th I mean, this is not such an easy do you, thing. Do you get visas to China? Do I? I know. Not after tonight, actually. <laughs> um, uh, so far, yes. Okay, interesting. Um, Let me open up to the floor. I see Pat Malloy here. Pat, you have a question? I see this gentleman has a book for you. He's meeting you in the morning. It's already signed. Did you know that? <laughs> Go ahead, Pat. Question, comment? Thank you, Jeremy, for inviting me. Um, I'm just struck, one, I, I do think that the trade figures that we use are the ones that most of the world uses mm. in, in, in measuring imports and exports. So something that China, China's got almost, well, they don't have, they had $4 trillion worth of foreign currency reserves. Mm. Some of that has fallen off because some of them are coming out of the country now to buy assets here and other places. But so they accumulate a lot of money somewhere. Yeah. So I think it's through trade surplus, to be yeah. honest with you. Um, so I think, uh, and, and, and the people use the figure for each billion dollars of trade deficit, you got to lose 7,000 jobs. That's what 
economists are telling me. So I think I, I tend to think we do have a problem in our trade with China. But I'm struck by this pharmaceutical issue. Why wouldn't we, if we put standards on our company, why wouldn't we say that the goods coming into our country have to meet those standards? And then put the pressure on our Chinese to inspect their own stuff, and we don't take it unless it meets our standards. Why are we over there trying to put our people into their plants? It just strikes me as... So for the camera, the question is why wouldn't we create a level playing field in inspections uh, in pharmaceuticals? Uh, what, what is driving this? Mm -hmm. Driving this outsourced this Right. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Jeremy? Uh, well, Pat, honored that you came, and thank you for being here. And I, and I would love to address briefly the first part of your question about 7,000 jobs being lost for every billion um, in surplus. Um, in, in, right, but on, on the deficit side. So uh, I believe that's Dr. Scott's EPI study that you're referring to. Um, oh, OK. That, that, OK. Um, the, I mean, from my understanding of that, uh, you know, that basically looks at a dollar spent on a Chinese product as a dollar not spent on an American product. Um, and, you know, where I have an issue with that is because often a dollar spent on a Chinese product is money going to American firms. So the Fed said that 55 cents of every dollar spent on Chinese imports goes to American firms. You know, part of that is the inputs that go in, and part of it is all the jobs it takes to get those products to market. So, you know, the warehousing, the transportation, um, the retailing, the marketing, the construction, the legal, the finance, et cetera. So um, uh, Chinese imports actually support millions of jobs in this country. Um, and so I, I, I feel like, um, you know, yes, th there is some disruption in Chinese imports, but I also feel that there's a lot of good that they do for other job sectors. Um, and that it's not all kind of a zero-sum game where we're just losing jobs to China with the imports that are coming in. Um, and the top-line numbers sort of bear that out. So if you look over the past 25 years, you see kind of rising imports and mostly falling unemployment, mostly. So we don't see a correlation in the numbers where we're bleeding jobs because we're bringing in all this stuff from China. Um, but. We could talk about that more offline, and I'd like to. Um, in terms of your the, the pharmaceutical point, you know, I wholeheartedly agree with you, and I feel like American firms often get in the position where they're like a kid in a candy store. This is a huge market. How, you know, how could I not be in this market? I need to make all kinds of concessions to be in this market. Oftentimes, China will will demand these concessions, um, and. God forbid you ask to actually inspect factories. Um, you know the doors are the doors are closed. I actually believe that America has a lot more leverage that we don't use. You know I'm I'm a little guy, right? But I'm I'm able to inspect my upstream factories because with the power of the purse, I either I either inspect or I bring my business somewhere else. And I think you're seeing more and more American companies doing that. Um, and I'm hoping that'll catch on because, I mean, I agree with you. I think it's unacceptable. And I think, you know, the FDA places the onus on companies to inspect and companies by and large are not inspecting. Um, mm. So it, it places the, you know, us, families, you know, in a very precarious position. Yes, right here. Um, so, Jeremy, thanks for writing this book. Stimulated a lot of great discussion, and my good friend Pat Roy, who I've worked with, worked for for many years. Uh, we're going to have lunch tomorrow. We're going to chew on this book all through lunch. <laughs> so you're welcome to come for lunch. For I'd recommend a little salad too. <laughs> we're going to we're going to chew on non-Chinese salads for tomorrow. Okay, okay, great. We're all at the monitor, so let's go. My question comes back to the fundamental issue of quality. Um, quality control is a system, it's mathematical. Um, Ed Deming invented it in the United States, and the Japanese invent, uh, adopted it, and they became great for quality in automobiles and in TVs during the 70s and 80s by adopting Ed Deming's voluntary enforcement of quality control. They deliver a quality product. So, the Chinese are not ready for that. I sense that it's a too poor a country. It's not Japan. They're not. They don't feel humiliated by the fact they're delivering sub-quality products mm. to America. So, what's 
wrong with uh, the state and federal governments asking for corporations who are importing to impose a quality control system? Their liability. Can I piggyback on that for a minute? Because when I visited in the past Motorola's facilities or Intel's facilities or subcontractors to Boeing or other, all of them have TQM programs and all of them employ massive numbers of Chinese and oftentimes Chinese in management. So is it as you move to a Chinese firm, is there no transfer of those habits and patterns? Or you know can I, yeah. Can I yeah. That? Yeah. Semiconductor industry, your cell phones that, are, that maybe have batteries that are burning a hole in your pocket right now. These, these companies that make semiconductors were American, California, Texas companies. But during the downturn, the financial crisis, they sold up their commodi now commodity semiconductors to the Chinese with American private equity money. These joint ventures who are making it in Japan and China would never sell in America unless they had their testing and quality control engineering in downtown Phoenix, Arizona. Mm. Every chip is sent to Phoenix for a quality control chip. Mm. That's, what makes, that's what makes Chinese mm. semiconductors work in your consumer. So our piggyback on piggyback on piggyback <laughs> questions. <laughs> And the mucus of right, and the mucus membrane. of pig intestines. Um, How does that figure in your yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, structurally deficient, and I'll, I'll I'll give you a couple examples. Um, the hearings were held uh, with Chairman Levin um, maybe a year or two ago about counterfeit parts wending their way into the DoD supply chain. Um, so here we have some of the the finest. American aerospace companies that are sitting at the end of a chain that begins um, in Chinese rivers where e-waste coming from the United States is essentially scrubbed in the river and then counterfeited to become a chip that looks new and, and moves its way through Middleman after middleman after middleman. When I talk about a long supply chain, I mean, I'm talking 15, 20 players before it gets to uh, the Boeings of the world or the L3 communications of the world. Um, those end users have some of the best quality control systems in the world. And guess what? Their upstream suppliers have the quality book. You know, when Aston Martin was sourcing accelerator pedals, you know, from China, they, they all had the book. They had the spec of what plastic needed to go in. It's just that the subcontractor of the subcontractor, the piggyback of the piggyback of the piggyback, needed to scrape a few more yuan into the margin, throws in a bit of counterfeit into the hopper, and it's not detected. And so by the time it gets to the end, you've got... James Bond putting his foot on the pedal and the pedal breaks. Um, and all of the Aston Martins for that year had to be recalled. Or we see, um, you know, the night vision goggles are suddenly not working. So part of the issue is that uh, American firms often do demand these standards, but you run right up against this systemic risk um, where it's, it's so tough to get quality out of such a long, opaque chain with companies that are badly governed. So I feel that the answer to this is that companies need to get more aggressive. And I mean, Apple is starting to do this a bit more where they're going at least to their first concentric circle of suppliers. But you know, you need to really move way, way up the chain. I mean, Aston Martin had no idea that they were five or six or seven players deep, you know, before the offending, like, little tiny injection molder who was making the plastic the wrong way that went into the pedals into one of the premier brands of the world, you know? So our companies need to be up on the lines pushing up that supply chain um, and armed by U.S. inspectors, I would say, um, along for the ride. Yes, right here. Are companies like Aston Martin or Lockheed, as you mentioned, and just American 
long supply chains and, and um, low prices, but in terms of coming from China, usually, is, is that not the case, that we're kind of accepting it, turning a blind eye because of that? I think in many cases one could say that, especially with consumer products, um, you know, where what is it? Everyday savings find you in the uh, you know in every aisle or what have you. Um, but nowadays you're seeing more and more American companies bringing industries back, even for basic consumer products. So there's a nice case study with GE um, with the light bulb, um, where they had brought. Um, light bulb manufacturing and R and D into China, and w found that because of the risk, it was becoming too expensive. Brought it back home again. Um, American Giant, which makes hoodies, um, decided that because of all these unforeseen costs from risks that you wouldn't even expect, make make making something basic as a hoodie so expensive, it's it's cheaper actually to make it here and sell it here. So I think we're you know we're starting to see the tide turning the other way. But I believe that consumers can also do more of a job of being vocal um, to the places that we buy I mean, from. Just just the other day, I mean I've gotten into gardening recently, and don't laugh because I'm <laughs> not the kind of guy who typically gardens, but I like gardening now. And I went to buy a little spade at the local Ace Hardware, and it was their high end. What I thought was the high end spade. I stuffed it in dirt. It wasn't that particularly hard dirt, and it immediately broke the first time I put it in in the ground. And I was so ticked off. I drove right back 20 minutes back to that Ace Hardware, and I said, "This is ridiculous." And I ended up so I got my money back and went and I bought something like a truly space age made in Scandinavia, something or other that cost me about ninety dollars for a spade to dig little holes for marigolds or whatever. But, but I mean, I. I I do think, to your question, which I found very interesting, many of us wouldn't return. We just accept the fact it was a crappy spade. We paid eight bucks for it. We're going to live with it. And so there's become a tolerance for low quality in some cases. I've also seen very high quality product come out of China, and I'm probably with Matt where I think there's, you know, Pat Malloy, there's a little bit more to worry about. But it, it brings me to, to what I think we'll, we'll use as our closeout question. Your, your book is so interesting because it's full of vignettes that are sort of shockers and help people understand that they ought to be more conscious. Maybe they really are already more conscious of it, you know, deep down, uh, you know, buried beneath the, their, their understanding of things. But U.S. companies are out to make money, move supply. They've got to be aware of what you're talking about, but they don't tend to effuse that. You don't send, you don't, uh, tend to get a sense from American companies. Now you may be, but over the last 20, 25 years, I haven't gotten the sense until recently that there was a recognition of the kinds of things you're talking about. Why do you think that is? Because they must have been getting real feedback on supplies, on lack of governance, on poor supplier quality, on poor management. Why has it, why has it taken so long to percolate through? I think part of that is cultural. So we saw with the, the faulty auto ignition switches from GM um, that uh, we heard time and time again sort of middle management saluting these these protocols and not really questioning the decisions behind them. Um, there have been from the C-suites this push to globalize for such a long time. You know, the gravitational pull of China, I think, has moved so many companies. There's billions and billions of dollars at stake. So I think that's that's part of it. You know, one also sees with the San Francisco Bay Bridge, you know, that the renovation of the bridge decks um, it was decided that, that China would build this bridge, even though Caltrans had contracted from China on an earlier bridge where the bolts were flying out of the bridge left and right and breaking. And, they, and yet they decided, okay, we're going to contract this from China and we're going to hire a company that's not a bridge builder. Uh, yeah. So now we have bridge welds um, that are breaking um, and cracked on the San Francisco Bay Bridge. Um, the governor said, well, we save a little bit of money, but then you wind up paying billions extra in like liability in the next earthquake um, and also in cost overruns. China is one of the big competitors for high-speed rail. Right. But but I would argue that high speed rail is a, a perfect distillation of all the problems of China's supply chain. So mm. rather than the Sputnik moment that we hear about, it's actually an example of how we have an enduring competitive advantage. Interesting. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please give Jeremy Haft a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Taking a look. Thank at you, Steve. China, Thank you, Steve. The hidden truth about China's economic miracle. Thank you so much.